Hi folks, we're back. I'm Larry Roller. It's my pal Jimmy. And I think we left off last week um, leaving Freehold Racetrack, going up to Lincoln Downs. That's correct. And uh, so we'll start off um, right at Lincoln Downs. I applied for stalls at Lincoln Downs uh, after the Freehold meet, mainly because when the condition sheet came out, their purses were double they, than they were at any other racetrack I raced at except for Roosevelt and Yonkers. And um, it was the first year ever in all the Boston racetracks that they ever had a harness track. So Lincoln Downs in 1971 was the first harness racing meet that they ever had. I applied for stalls and I got them. So I entered a bunch of horses and a couple of them got in opening night. And um, I was sitting in the shed row the morning of the race and uh, reading the program. And I look up and down the shed row come, coming at me with three giants. They look like the front line of the <laughs> New York Giants. And they reach me and the one guy in the middle, he says, Are you Larry Roller? I says, yep. I says, what can I do for you? He says, well... I'm with um, I'm with Whitey Bolger, and um, we we run all these racetracks around here. And I says, "Well, good for you." So he says, um, "You interested in making any money?" <laughs> and at that point, as fat and ugly as he was, I wanted to kiss him right on the lips because <laughs> I was broke. I needed money. The race I win at Freehold, a few dollars I had, just got me up here. And uh, uh, I, I, I just, I, I wanted to kiss the guy, but. Well, so I said, what do you have not, in mind? Let's, let's not say you did. Well, no. <laughs> so he says, he says, uh, um, I says, uh, what do you have in mind? He says, well, you have, you have uh, two horses in today, both morning line favorites. Um, I'll give you $200 for each of them, just be worse than third. And uh, he says, all you have to do is just tell me the stall number and we'll take care of the rest. I'll have my vet down there. And, and um, so I said to him, I says, listen, I said, um, you're going to give me 500 for each horse, cash up front and tell your vet to stay home. He says, you know who the fuck you're talking to? I says, it, ma it makes no difference. That, that's the deal. You, you want a deal? That's, that's a deal. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you that my word is a lot better than anything your veterinary can give my horses. So he says, what'd you say? You wanted 500 a horse? I want 500 a horse cash right now. And he's looking at his friends like, you believe this fucking guy? And, All right. He takes the money out of his pocket. He counts out $1,000. He gives it to me. He says, I sure hope you know what you're doing, because I'll be back in the morning. And I says, bring coffee and a bagel. <laughs> and he left. The next morning, he comes back. And uh, he must have did really well. I finished fourth with both horses. And uh, I made $1,000. And as good as the purses were, um, say the purse was $2,000, just to give you an example. The winner gets 50% of the 2000 which means the winner gets uh, $1,000. Um, second place gets half of that. Third place gets half of that, all the way down to fifth place. So I collected fourth place money plus 500 and um, I saved my horse for a, a, an, another day. So he says to me, he says, um, when you got another horse in, and I says, probably in two or three days, they didn't draw yet. He says, you think you can get any of these guys here that, you know? And I says, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll, see, I'll see what I could do. He says, we can make a lot of money. He says, I control everything around this town. He says, I can get off, off track, bookmakers, and everything else. I says, all right. Now, now, the edge that I had, even though I didn't know these other guys that were there, was that all of these small tracks 99% of the trainers 
are broke. They're living in tack rooms with their families. They have no money. And the 50% of the purse money that you get, is that's if you own the horse. If you're just the driver or the trainer of the horse, right. you get 10%. So if you don't own the horse and you don't and you only train the horse, which is what all of them guys do, they don't have money to own a horse. They have owners. So if the purse is two thousand and you win, the owner gets a thousand dollars. Out of that thousand dollars, you get ten percent. So you get a hundred dollars. So I'm going to give you five hundred to be worse than not not to win. To You're going to be waking right? a lot more money, and uh, you can save your horse for another day. Plus, if you have three or four horses in. You make a lot of money. The bottom line was, within a week, I had like 10 guys, 10 guys uh, ready yeah, to do anything ready, I wanted ready them to, to be do. On the pad. So, yeah, and, and, yeah. That, and that's what it was. And I, I just pick up the program, and I, and I see who's in there. I have the names of the guys, and, and I go to them. Oh, okay. And, and most According of the time, they what the they morning say, line was, right? Yeah, if right. they were morning line favorite, they would get 500. If they were second choice, they get 250 or 300, something like that, whatever it was. Right. And, and the meet went on. It was a short meet, but by the end of the meet, I, I had I, I walked away I left that that track with uh, probably thirty thirty five thousand dollars plus paid all expenses plus paid everything plus was having a good time. The only problem I had up there was uh, and it really wasn't my problem was Tony's problem the, the guy who the big fat guy his name was Tony Shula big fat jerk part of the Whitey Bulger crew. And, no, no, you're right, and, because Whitey White, was known as an arrogant psychopath. Yeah, well, he, he, that's exactly what he was. He was an arrogant psychopath. And this guy was his own guy. But what Tony was doing, because he was, he was an arrogant jerk too, uh, what he was doing was he was busting out all the bookmakers yeah, in town. he was playing all sides, right. Yeah, and not saying nothing to Whitey. Now, after he got busted, half the bookmakers in town were Whitey Bulger's bookmakers. So whenever they went broke, they went to Whitey for more money. Whitey would give him more money for one point. So if he gave him twenty thousand, he was collecting the <laughs> He's vig. Picking plus up on he all stole, yeah, Jesus. he was good. But so he went. He he come to me one day, and um, same type thing. It, it was uh, in, in the morning, and who shows up but him, it's Whitey Bulger and one other guy. You Larry Roller, same same routine. Yeah. You dealing with a guy, Tony, fat Tony Shula? Yeah. Um, he's busting out all my bookmakers. <laughs> uh, what do you, uh, that's him, not me. He says, you, you're doing something with him? I says, yeah. He says, uh, when does he come here? I says, he comes every morning about 10, 11 o'clock. So he says, um, all right. I says, why, what's the problem? I says, if there's something that I should know, you need to tell me. If there's something, I know who you are, I know what you do, and I know what I've been doing. This is your guy, he ain't my guy. If I need to stop, I stop. No, 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 that's all right, I'll straighten it out. So um, he says to me, he says, he busted out all my bookmakers, which is no problem because I make money off of that. But now there's no other bookmakers in town. He's busting out. He's busting out everybody. And the problem with that is, he didn't say a word to me. I don't know nothing about oh. it. Who knows how much money he won? He busted out everybody and never said a word to me. So, um, who comes walking down? Tony Shula. The street guy. Oh, Whitey, how you doing, Whitey? Whitey you know, Larry. You're trying to play it off. Right? Yeah. He says, <laughs> "Listen, you fat fuck." <laughs> That's why he bowled it on him. He said, Listen, you fat fuck. He says, You busted out every one of my bookmakers, plus the other ones outside of town. He says, And I never heard nothing about it. From what I understand, your, with your winnings, I'm supposed to get a minimum of 20% of that. You have $50,000 for me tomorrow morning. Well, Larry, you won't have to worry about seeing him no more. <laughs> So uh, that's how that's how that that ended, and, and I'm sure Tony Shula took care of of Whitey after that because I never got another visit from Whitey, and uh, but he he was uh, he's not only an arrogant guy but a scary guy, just a little thin guy, you know, just a just just look at 
just, just like he knew who the fuck he was. And he was he was a psychopath. He was even though he was a fucking rat, and, and I'm sure everybody knows the story that yeah, his he brother did more was work than people got hair in their head. Yeah, he killed he killed a lot of guys, but he had the protection because he was working both sides with the government and so. So anyway, so now, now what happens is one day Tony Tony comes to me, and we're, we're doing really well, and he's as he's walking away, he says, uh, he says. Uh, um, you you want any action? He says. Uh, he says I I got a I got a an edge on um, I think it was a college basketball. So oh, yeah, what what, yeah. what what am I gonna say? I, you know he's making money for me and everything. Uh, yeah, well, if you have an edge, you know I, I figured another way to earn some money. If you have an edge, bet for me. Well, you know he's well. What do you want? What what, what do you think? I you know you know. Give me a couple of thousand on whoever, whatever. He would just follow his lead. Just follow his lead. Just only because we're doing a lot of stuff together. And even if I right. lost it, it, it wouldn't mean that much. No, still, the karma was there. Right. But we win. He win. I think he was fixing college basketball games or something like that. I didn't know. I didn't care. All I know is that he come back to me and he give me uh, two or three thousand. And the next day he says, uh, you want any more action? I got some more. To, and, and it started. And it started, and it started, and it started me going too. Now all of a sudden, from my only addiction was racing, girls, and music, now I have gambling as an addiction. I want more. Gambling, <clears throat> which I have no control over. Gambling, which is just, but I figured it wasn't gambling just like me. No, he took the gamble winning. out of gambling. There was no gamble. It was, no, it was you just, were winning. Right? I was I was winning, so let, let's go. Now, by the end of the meet, uh, I'm 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 addicted. I'm I'm thinking, should I get stay involved with this guy? Call him up. You know, I did him a favor here. He went a lot of money for the meet, and um, and and I says, you know what? I says, the the, the hell with it. I you know, but when so for, when when that meet ended. As it was ending, I applied for stalls at Monticello, hoping that because of six years went by, even though it was a New York track, maybe they would give me stalls and reinstate me. What happened was at Monticello, the owner of the track, Charles Slutsky, he owned like 55% of it, and then all the other hotel owners, uh, Milton Kutcher, who owned Kutcher's, and Manny Halbert, who owned the Raleigh, right, and... Right. And so they own they own the rest of it, but the main guy was uh, um, uh, Slutsky, Ben Slutsky. He died, left it to his son Charles. Charles is the new guy. I applied for stalls. I get him in New York. First right. time I was ever allowed back in New York, even though it was a small upstate track, I was still allowed in New York. So now I get the stalls in New York, and I'm now I'm thinking, should I call this guy? Do I go up there now? All of a sudden now. I'm into betting basketball, college, uh, uh, hockey, <laughs> football, da, 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 everything, <laughs> and and it got to be, it got to be a habit. Now I, I'm I'm making money with the horses and and losing it because of this addiction, and it, it only got worse. It's like, it's like every gambler. I, I think they say that that uh, somewhere in the back of a gambler's brain, he really wants, he wants to, to lose. lose yeah. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I, it's just, to me, defeating that, how could I not win? Why, why? you know, I, and, and, I, and I couldn't, and it got worse. And the more I tried to beat him, the more I lost. And there was a time, it's hard to believe, but trust me, it's true, that I, I hooked up with a, a Jewish um, a bookmaker in, in Monticello called Barney Cutler. He was from the old Jewish mob. And that was the first guy I, I ever got involved with. Um, I had Kabert on the line because I met him in Freehold after I went a couple of races and he was there. And, and he says, yeah, whatever you want, anything you want. And he may not have been a bookmaker, but he, he was the guy I yeah, went to who, who, yeah. who, who put me in the right direction. So now I'm dealing with Kabert and I'm dealing with Barney Cutler. 
and I'm, I'm bet. And the only thing that's keeping me alive is that I'm fixing races in a small way at Monticello because the handle, the handle at Monticello was two hundred thousand a night. You really, you know, even though I fix one or two races a day, you win a thousand to You know, it just, it just wasn't it's enough. It's a grind. It's a grind. It, yeah. And the worst part about the grind, it wasn't enough to cover what I was betting and losing. But I, I, I could, I couldn't stop. And then. And then you you put in the picture. Yeah, you shy. Uh, well, <laughs> that, that 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 comes real quick. That, that, then you put put into the picture that um, the Concord Hotel, the largest bar in the world, all the bungalow bunnies, all the bands, and then uh, the nightlife up there during the summer months was uh, like no yeah, other. It was it was un yeah. un un unbelievable. And. Um, then you get involved with girls. You get involved with going out. You get involved with tipping. So you have, and before you know yeah, it, I had the front table and, 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 and then it goes on and on and on and on. And then uh, you create an image that you have to live up to. I That's mean, you right. may walk in the place with twenty thousand one night and give the guy a, a hundred dollars for a front table to see Steve and Edie, and then you go back the, the next night and you lost the twenty thousand and. The, but you got to get it somewhere. You got to get it so somewhere. It's a, it's a, you got to keep it's up It's a cash right. flow problem that you have to overcome on a nightly basis for more reason than one. Okay. So now I, get, I become very, very friendly with Charles Slutsky, who owned Monticello Raceway. And the reason I become friendly with him was because the, the waitress, I always had a table in a dining room because I always had a front table right up against the glass because I always fix one or two races in a small way, just enough to make 1500 2000 whatever. And the guys up there were great because the purse money was the worst ever. And everybody was broke. Every trainer was broke. They just do it for the love of it. And they, they just yeah, hand to mouth. Love. It was yeah. just, yeah. And that's what it was. It was a labor of love. They just, they just loved it. So, um, so what, what happened was Monica, for some reason... I mean, I never come on to her. She just liked me and liked me a lot. The problem was that Slutsky, who owned the racetrack, even though he was married, he liked he Monica liked her a lot. too. <laughs> so whenever I was at the Concord Hotel after the races, Monica was there and Charles was there. And before you know it, we became, and he knew. He knew that she liked me and 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 I was... I was a player in more ways than one. You know, I just, naturally you, you want a girl, a girl comes on to you, you're not going to chase her. I wasn't good at ever picking up girls. I was lucky enough for whatever reason to have girls co co come at me. Yeah, migrate towards you, right. So uh, I become very, very friendly with Charles. So one day Charles calls me over and he says, uh, he says, um, uh, Monica tells me that you love music. That's why you're at the Concord all the time. I says, that's right. I, I just I just love it. He says, I'm having a pool party. He says, is there a group that you can get for me to, for my pool party? So I says, Sh sure. I says, a good friend of mine, Danny Lamego and the Jumping Jacks. They'll oh, play. Man. So he says, okay, great, get them. So I, I get I get them, and they, we have the pool party. So he was, Danny was in his prime. He was yeah, great. Yeah, he was... He, he was to me, he was the best. I, I just, I'd rather see him than Louis Prima, Sinatra, all of them. I, he was just great for me. So anyway, we go to the pool party, and I'm just sitting in front of the band listening. Slutsky, who also owned the Neville Hotel, which is the, the, the cream of the crop up there as far as hotel goes, the Concord, the Raleigh, they were all, you know, they were all... D different kind of places, all pickup joints. The, the firemen had their conventions there, the police had their conventions there, hookers used to pile in there. Yeah, it, to it was just a different. <laughs> the, the Neville, which is in Fallsburg, that Charles owned, was a high end place. Whenever the commission had to go, they went to the racing commission, all went for up to the Neville. Right. All the poli all the, the, go the government, the senators, congressmen, every New York State, they all went to the Neville. All the other places. Were, now, sometimes they went to the Neville and they snuck to the Concord, but they, they right. always, that's where they, that's where. So anyway, I, I'm at the pool party. I'm playing. I'm, pl I'm, I'm listening to music, sitting with Benny, Betty, Danny, Danny's uh, wife. And uh, Ronnie Ingrassi, one of the trainer drivers there, he was friendly too with Charles. 
he comes down, he says, Charles wants to see you in the house. So I go up in the house, and there's all these guys with suits and ties, and all, all uh, they were all congressmen, guys from the racing commission, the head of the racing commission, and they're all sitting there in the beginning of the mound of cocaine. And everybody has a card, and they're all pushing it by them. And, and it's all the so Ron, so Charles says, help yourself. I says, Charles, I, I don't do that. I'm, I'm going back to the band. So I go back to the band, and about a half hour later, Ronnie comes back and says, Charles, says, Charles, watch you up there. Why don't you go, go up there? So I go back up. What, what, what's the matter, Charles? He says, uh, what, you know, have, have some fun. Loosen up. I, I loosen up down there. I don't do this stuff. I don't right, drink. Right. I don't do this stuff. So after the party's over, I get a hold of Charles. And I says, Charles, word is all over the place that come December, November, December, OTB, off-track betting, is going to open up all betting parlors in New York State. Mm -hmm. Every racetrack, including yours, and the whole United States closed for a week before Christmas all the way up to a week after Christmas. So, so for like four weeks, there's no track open in the whole country. Right. You have <clears throat> in your hotel all the guys that make the racing dates. Right. Just tell them you would like racing dates for them for weeks. Your handle will go from 200000 a night to 20 million a That's night. Right. You'll make more money in them four <laughs> weeks than you will in five yeah. years of, right. So he says, yeah, you, you got a point. I says, plus OTB is gonna, sure. I says, you'll make, you'll make a, a ton of money. Sure. So he says, okay. So, I, so sure enough, about two weeks later, he says, I got the dates. I says, good. Now I'm thinking, now, I already had, because I've been up there for, for three, four months already, I already had a whole crew of drivers mm -hmm. that knew. I had maybe seven or eight guys that we, we, whenever we were in together, yeah. we would fix the race. Yeah, Well-oiled machine, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so now, so now <laughs> I'm, I, I, I don't even know where to begin. So I, I get a hold of my friend, so you're Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's exciting. It's, sure. It's been living in the Playboy Mansion, for me, anyway. I got Charlie, I got my cousin Joe Knapp, and I got um, one other guy. I can't, a, a real whack job. But the reason I picked these, th these three guys was um, they knew all about gambling. They knew about the racetrack. I couldn't ever afford anybody to get shut out. They knew not to get shut out. They right. knew how to bet. They knew if I had to exactly. make a four horse box, they knew what to do, how to do it, exactly. how much time they needed. They didn't even have to think about that. And if they ever win 50, 60, 70,000 and somebody comes up to them and says, how'd you win that? Where'd you get the money? They, they have no problem saying, what the fuck? Yeah. How come you didn't ask me when I lost yeah, last like week and the week I before lost. and the week exactly, before yeah. and the week before that? Right. Do me a favor. Go fuck yourself. It's none of your business. <laughs> and that's that was these guys. And they had the right to do that. Right. So uh, now the winter meet is approaching. I have all the runners. I sit down and I tell them. I says, okay, <clears throat> you go to the – I'm going to give you the numbers. You go to the OTB and, and – and, um, in Middletown. You go to the one in Yonkers, and I just spread them out, the three of them. Right. And uh, I'll have Gina or somebody bet for me here if if need be. Now, the the racetrack is relatively empty because it's the winter time in Monticello. The summer, the summer all the whole people with the hotels, the hotels are even half, half empty. But the handle now becomes humongous. Sure. Where... Prior to that, prior to that, if you made a two hundred dollar bet on a horse, the odds would go from ten to one to two to one. Right. Exactly. Now, if you bet twenty thousand on a horse, the odds would actually go up. Right. That's how much money was wow. in the mutual pool. Wow. So it was it was unbelievable. So now I have everything laid out. Now I can't wait for opening night and everything. I have everything planned. The condition sheet. And the sheet comes out three days prior to the race. They draw for positions. 
now I got the sheet for, say, the opening night. Right. And I'm looking at the sheet, and it tells you all the races, who's in and everything. So now opening night, I'm looking to fix every race because every better in the world is going to be there. And I see, and we were able to fix five or six races. Now, five or six races with each pool being a half a million dollars, um, it, you win a tremendous amount of money. So anyway, I have it all set up. So now, two days, I think two or three days before the meet actually starts, and I'm ready to go. I get paid to the stable gate. Larry Roller to the stable gate. I go down there, and I look, and I see outside the stable gate this big black Cadillac. It's that fat fuck from Tony oh. Shula from, from Lincoln Downs. So I get out of my car, I go through the stable gate. I said, what the fuck are you doing here? Well, what are you doing here? He said, what am I doing? It's the only game in town, the only game in the, that's, that's what we're doing here. You know, why, ain't you happy to see me? I said, do me a favor, good. there's a diner on top of the hill. Go on top yeah, of the sure. hill and, uh, and I'll be up there in 10 minutes. So now I'm thinking, what do I do? I, I can't really chase him because even though I hate his guts and what I didn't know I found out later was that the last race of the meet at Lincoln Downs, one of the guys run over the money. One of the guys took 200. He was supposed to finish worse than third. He finished third, but he right. couldn't help it. And that shit happens. So you make it up the next race. Right, exactly. Well, that didn't fly with these didn't guys. didn't fly with him, it don't, don't, right. it don't fly. It, it's just... And 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 um, I and how I found out was I, I got a call, and uh, from one of the trainers that were up there, he says, you know, when you left, because I shipped out the same same the closing night, he says, you, you know, when you left uh, in the parking lot, your friend beat the shit out. Yeah, of I know he. That's the one he gave the beating to, yeah. right? And he gave him a bad beating. He was in the hospital. Wow. He's in the hospital for about two weeks. So I, I, and he was going to go to the cops, and I says, tell him, please don't do that. All his hospital bills will be paid. I'll take care of it. I'll send him a couple of thousand for himself. Just don't tell him because he's only going to get himself in trouble. Right. So because he's, he's a part of it, you know. Why'd you get the beat? Because I took my, right. so he's only going to, so, so I sent down a bunch of money, and I squashed that whole thing. So now I go up to the diner. And the three of them are sitting in this big Fleetwood Cadillac. And I said, what are you doing? I you sitting in this fucking freezer. It's 20 degrees out here. Go, let's go inside. He says, I can't go inside. I can't fit in the boots because they only had boots. <laughs> so he couldn't fit in the boots. So I sit in the car with him. Now, all these guys are over 300 pounds. They're gigantic. And I says... Um, I says, w w w you come all the way here for a fucking, he says, the, you know, it's the only game in town. I said, Tony, listen. I says, I appreciate what you did for me. I says, but I found out what you did closing night. The guy took my fucking money. I said, but yeah, we make it up. There was no more races. There was no more. He had a point, but... He wasn't supposed to do yeah, it. Yeah, but he could anyway. have made it up on the next in the next. But there alley. was no next thing. That was the last race of the meet. That that was his point. If there was another race, maybe he would have did it, maybe not. Uh, who knows? Anyway, he was a big arrogant jerk who just overpowered everybody because he had two gorillas with him and he was big himself. He just had to show who he was, right? Yeah, and and that's what they did. That's what Bulger crew did with, with everybody. With the bookmakers up there, they would just Whitey Bulger was lucky that he was in a certain part of town because down the road a bit were the Italians who really didn't pay him too much mind. But anyway, that, that's a whole other story. So anyway, so I says, I sent, I sent 5000 down there to fix this up. I said, if you're going to be here, you ever pull this fucking wise guy shit? We're not in Boston now. We're, not in, we're, 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 we're over here. We're in New York. Yeah. I says, and... The way you grew up over there, that's how I grew up over here. So I'm telling you, we'll make money, we'll be friends, somebody runs over the money, They'll make rip it up your on fucking the next tickets one, right? up, and we'll make it up on the right. next race. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so now I level with him. I, I, I just level with him because there was plenty of money, so I level with him. And I told him, you just bet at the track. 
my guys will bet at all the OTB players. Right. Now, an OTB, when you win 10000 or more, they give you $10,000 stacks wrapped in saran wrap like Swiss cheese. It's just shrink-wrapped, 10,000 right. packs. By the end of, by the, end of the, the, the winter meet, which is two weeks or a week after New Year's, uh, I, I had a whole bottom drawer of my dresser filled with stacks of $10,000. <laughs> I had the middle drawer full of all 50s and 100s that, that were loose. And then the top drawer with all the bullshit, you know, 5s and 10s and 20s. A lot of money. And you probably had more relatives than you could imagine, too. And, well, no, they didn't, they, they didn't bother me because what, what I did, I kept kind of private. Don't forget, I'm 150 miles away from home. Plus, I haven't been home or in that area for, for, for 10 years. So the end of the meet is coming close, and we're all flush. We're all making money. But in the meantime, my bets now with Cabert and with Barney now on, on I, I, I almost stopped with the college games. I was betting 500 a game, 101 college games. In the middle of the fucking night, I'm calling colleges. Uh, I'm from the New York Post. Can you tell me what the score was? Because you never, you never know unless you're Right, in. right. And that, that's how sick it got. But I stopped w w with that because I just got too busy. So I just started betting the pro games. It was the football. And... Um, uh, I start betting the football and losing and losing. Now I'm betting 20 a game with each guy, 40,000 a game. Bet 10, 11 games, lose, 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 lose. Now I lose, I lose before January, maybe going into just a couple of weeks before the Super Bowl. I, uh, I lose like a million dollars, a million and a half dollars. To both of them. And every Tuesday, I show up. I pay cash. Every, no problem. And uh, yeah, That's one thing. You never missed a payment. Never missed a payment. So now, things are, getting, things are getting a little hairy. And I'm broke. But I'm addicted. Now, it's, it's uh, you know, I never paid much attention to it because I always have something to say about you can't stop smoking. You can't stop drinking. How could you not stop smoking? How you, it's, it's an addiction. You can't. You can't stop the drugs. It's an addiction. I have a gambling addiction. I, I can't even explain how you, you just start shaking if there's a game on and you, you, know, you, you got to bet. You got to bet. It's like, like it talks to you. So, so, so now, now I'm broke. So I call up Kabert and I say, listen, I'm going to Florida to buy some uh, property uh, so you won't see me for a couple of weeks. Knowing he's gonna say, no problem, just call me up for the line. Yeah, but if I lose, I won't be here to pay. Don't worry about it, don't worry. And I knew they were gonna say that, both him and Barney were gonna say that. Right. They got a cash cow in me, so sure. you're gonna be, that, that you paid, the right thing. You right. paid a million, a million, right. and so, so. And I knew they were gonna say that, so now sure enough, <laughs> I go to Florida. And uh, the first but you're week, still, but you're still calling in the meantime. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I go to Florida. Well, that was the whole thing. I'm hoping I get even in, a, in right. a week or two and get some make a score. So now I go to Florida. And I call up first week. Mentality. I lose like eighty eighty thousand. Now whatever it was. Second week. And now I call up and say, uh, "Listen, I told you I owe you eighty ninety whatever it is." I says, "I won't be back for another week. The closing ain't for another week, week and a half." Don't worry about it. You want the line for Sunday? Sure. Oh. Okay. Give me a line for Sunday. Make a long story short, by the third week, I'm stuck. 700000 I come back, and I have a decision to make. Uh, kill myself, run away, or go back and face the music. My whole life, I never ran away from a problem. Never, ever. Try to make myself right, but if I was wrong, if I was right, I'd never run away. And but if I was wrong, I stood there and took the thing. I seen too many guys in the position that uh, I'm in for a whole lot less more money, run away and destroy their lives, their family. Friends, he got caught. 
and eventually they got the ship beat out of them or, or dead. But I, I would never do that anyway. I come back, and I go see the madman, Gabert. This is where you went on the boat. <laughs> well, now, now he he um, he he knew something was wrong. I didn't see Kabert. I saw the guy that he sent for me at the airport. I called him up. Says I'm coming in. Can you have somebody pick me up? He has somebody pick him up. Who was the guy that I was betting with? He was the guy. I wasn't calling Kabert direct, but Kabert was the guy. So I was calling this other guy. He was the guy that picked me up. I forgot what his name was. So anyway. Well, he put you with somebody else. That's he put me yeah. with somebody else. But it was, Kabert was getting, you know, sure. it was Kabert's control. Exactly. So anyway, so now he gets me in the car and uh, he says, uh, how'd you make out? And I says, um, all right. I says, um, he says, uh, you want to stop home? What do you, you know, you, he wants to see you now. I says, I, got, I don't have the money. He says, what? I don't have the money. So he says, uh, I'm going to have to call him. And um, I says, well, do whatever you have to do. Bring me down there. He says, well, I got to call him first. I got to let him know. So he calls him. And Kubert says, all right, you bring him down here tomorrow morning. So he takes me home. Next morning I meet him, and we go down to Atlantic Highlands, I think it was. You go in this little coffee shop down the road. He's in the back there. And two of his guys, he's smoking a cigar and they're sitting there. And, and he just, he looks at me with the other guy. I can't think of his name. And he just gets up and he walks out. And the other two guys follow him. Well, it takes me to the pier out, maybe a 30-foot boat or whatever it was. They go downstairs, go downstairs. Takes me out in the ocean. Yeah, ultimatum time. <laughs> and uh, the motors stop. The guy brings me upstairs. They put me in this little half a 55 gallon drum. They get in there. Get in there. They pour a couple of bags of cement. They start pumping some water. And Kabert comes out. He says, That fucking nitwit let you go too far. That's on him. You went too far. That's on you. Now you tell me why I shouldn't let this cement harden and throw you the fuck overboard. 